Welcome to another Dragonland Saga review episode. It is Bakukul Dark Ember the 17th. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my review of Galen Benighted by Michael Williams. I would like to take a moment and thank the members of this YouTube channel and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below and remind you that you can always pick up Dragonlance Gaming materials using my affiliate links also in the description below. Now, this is just my opinion, and who am I, really? You might have a different opinion, and that's okay. I would love to hear your opinion if it differs from mine and, you know, a little echo chamber action if you do agree with me. I like to hear that, too. <laughs> from time to time, but not exclusively. And that's what's important. All right, anyway... Um, I would invite you to sort of throw up your comments if you're watching this live in the chat about this book as I go through it or any other Dragonlance comments. I see there's a couple in there I want to address already. And then after the fact, if you're watching this, then, you know, throw them in the comments below and, and we'll get that if you're not watching live. All right. So the way these work, I've given a pre-written review of this that I wrote. I usually break up the book into like 100 pages-ish. And then I just review after that 100 pages. That's just how I'm comfortable doing it so that I can actually remember everything about it and I don't miss important events throughout the course of reading it. This is not going to be a good review for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, I had a shit week and so I'm just really in a bad mood. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to uh, elevate my, uh, my um, perspective right now, but I'm, I'm kind of pissed. I, this book is actually part of that because it's not good. I really, really, really did not like this novel, which frustrates me because I really enjoyed the first one. So this is a sequel to Weasel's Luck. This is in the Heroes 2 collection. Weasel's Luck is in the Heroes 1 collection. So, eh, let's get into it and then I'll start addressing some stuff uh, that you guys are talking about already. So I have to say, now that I'm 100 pages in, this is not as good a beginning as Weasel's Luck was. As that novel began with the ridiculousness of the Pathwarden family, this begins with the mundane activities of Castle de Kayla. It's not a welcome change either. Even the humor in this novel isn't landing as well as the first one. I don't know if it's because I'm not in the right mind frame, or it's just worn off, or it's just simply not there. There are moments when the characters are laughing or suppressing laughter, and I'm sitting here reading it wondering what I missed. We open with Gaiden Pathwarden Brightblade at the end of his Night of Reflections and the beginning of the ceremony that will honor him as a Knight of Salamnia. While the Night of Reflections are supposed to be just that, Galen found himself staring into one of the opals turned brooch from the Scorpion. He sees plainsmen in the brooch, and they turn to see him and tell him, or rather show him and tell him, that they have his brother Brithelm, and that if he wants him back, Galen needs to bring them the opals. That, they allude to a return of the opals, so perhaps the scorpion took them from the plainsmen, and now that he's dead, they've come to get them. In either case, it's just odd that they're able to communicate through the opals, and even more odd that they would know who Galen is or that he has them at all so as to then abduct Brithelm and then ransom, ransom him off for the opals to Galen. So with the convenient contrivances in place, the setting is amid an unusual massive storm that is drowning the countryside. Sir Bayard Brightblade is embarrassed when Galen doesn't show up for his knighthood and he finds Galen passed out in his room. He berates him as Galen tells him Bayard... I'm sorry, um, as Galen tells Bayard about the vision and his brother being abducted, Bayard openly laughs hysterically at him about the story. Which is weird, because the story wasn't even remotely funny at all, so why is he laughing? Then he berates him for not putting on his armor fast enough. It's almost like Bayard is so frustrated over castle management and married life that he's taking it out on Galen. Galen is seen as a weasel still by all other Salamnic knights, and no one respects him at all. Bayard tells Galen that they need to go on a quest to recover Brithelm and that Galen needs a squire. He ends up settling for his older abusive brother, Alfric, which makes no sense other than for the convenience of the story, and Bayard falls from his horse, breaking his leg, and then appoints Galen as the mission commander. Naturally, no one wants him to be it, but with Galen's gift of gab and apparent kiss-up talent, he changes the mind of Ramiro the Maw, and they plan their outing. 
This is when Danelle re-enters the picture. She wants to get away from washing duties her uncle had put her on, and so she stows away with Galen's permission. We learn that Galen has been having sex with the baker Marigold, and that she sends him pastries in embarrassing shapes. This actually reminds me of my own baking gifts. Uh, for a male friend of mine, I made a cherry pie which featured, uh, which featured a meringue vulva. Yeah. And uh, for a female friend, I made a chocolate cake in the shape of a man's um, twig and berries, we'll say. You know, fun! Anyway, the journey is tedious, as tedious as this commentary, and it is prolonged by Ramiro's insistence on stopping early and leaving late every night and morning in order to eat. He is quite the prodigious knight. There are also nearly an entire chapter about Danelle complaining about doing laundry and everyone hiding their snickering over it. I have no idea why it would be funny, other than to suggest that her being discontent about doing laundry is some sort of aberration amongst women who should just enjoy doing laundry and that makes them laugh because she doesn't? Like, I just don't understand why it was funny at all. In other case, it didn't land for me at all. And this is all capped off by a visitation from a troll. Now, the troll was a brutal fight, but ultimately they fought it off and sent it running from tor with torches. So Romero gives flight after the troll, forcing the others to also try to hunt down the troll with him to extinction, but they're all jumped by pale plainsmen who are intent on not only stealing Ga Galen's opals, but killing the group as well. They had not expected as much resistance as they received, however, and they also were defeated and forced to retreat. However, Alfric sacrificed him for Galen in a touching moment that was not returned by Galen's reaction until much later in the story. And this bothered me. We have no sense of a burial or a fire or a cairn, nothing. Uh, apparently, they just literally left his body laying on the ground. That was it. Just, well, there goes my brother slash squire, and they move on with the story. They all continued in search of the plainsmen when they ran across a blind juggler named Shardos and his dog. To be fair, Shardos threw a rock at Galen, nearly hitting him, but again, the juggler is blind, so who knows if it was intentional or happenstance. As the story progresses, it is revealed that it's nearly prophecy, as the tale of the black opals is unraveled throughout exposition by the plainsmen and Shardos. So Shardos also believes tales, I'm sorry, shares tales of the Dragonlance Chronicles, which won't happen for another 150 years, legends, which won't happen for another 150 years slash like 200 years previous, and Huma, which happens a thousand years before. This leads me to the obvious conclusion that either Shardos is the author in the story or a god. And some of the events won't happen for more than a hundred years and others happening up to a thousand years before. It just makes no logical sense at all. Except for the, you know, that, that sort of moment where a, in a film or in a book, when the title is dropped by one of the characters and you're like, ah, a little break in the fourth wall there. That's the only reason why this could have been put in by Michael Williams. And he does this a couple times, not just with the stories. He does it with his own poetry, which is a little bit like, uh, you know. So they proceed in search of a plainsman with Shardos in tow to find some of them. You see the plainsmen were granted the opals inset into crowns. And there are 12 opals per crown and 12 crowns, one for each plainsman tribe. I know, very Lord of the Rings. Anyway, the tribes were granted these by the gods in the Age of Dreams in order to communicate with each other and share their histories. Gnomes didn't invent palm pilots or blackberries or iPhones yet, so you use opals. Oy vey. Um, this was effective until nearly 400 years ago, one of the priests called the Namers wanted an extra stone which would give him power over life and death. This is the actual crux of the entire story, as this namer, named Firebrand, was outcast by his Quenara tribe. This tribe removed one of his eyes to show other tribes that he was in fact an outcast, and he went to form or take over the new Quenara tribe, which is now called the Quetana tribe, and they live under the ground. I was getting very strong um, 
uh, H.G. Wells's um, time machine vibes from this story, like really strongly. So this is all a scheme by Sargonis, by the way, or so we're led to believe at this point. Anyway, the Quainara split their stones for those above ground and those below ground, and Firebrand wants them all, and more, to fulfill his goal of power per Sargonis' instruction. Since half of the stones were stolen by the Scorpion before the Cataclysm, they're luring Galen, the current owner of them, by kidnapping his brother to them. It is a convoluted story. Hell yes, it is. But if I'm being honest, at the time of writing this, I'm kind of digging it thus far. It changes. The narrative switches from first person with Galen to third person with the tri plainsman and Bayard, who is still back at Castle Decayla. This is a little bit awkward and strange, and there's really no point in doing it, but whatever. Um, oh, geez. So Galen... I'm sorry, Bayard, who is still back at Castle de Kayla, is growing increasingly restless as he's healing from his broken leg. He finds that in the library, there's a reference from the Scorpion that there's an underground threat that will take out the castle, whether they succeed in defeating him or not. And so, Bayard delves deep under the castle with some knights and his wife Enid to discover what that threat is. They find a massive creature... Not sure what it could be, as Galen and his companions also go underground, uh, finding the tunnels that are supposedly leading to Firebrand. So Galen and his companions wander through the dark tunnels, being attacked by local creatures, and end up climbing a shaft, only to end up face-to-face -face with the Quaitana. Ramiro's squire, one of the guys that came along with Galen, ran off the other direction that they came so that Danelle, the girl who came with him, can be led by Shardos the blind man with his dog, to the surface to go fetch help because they know they're screwed. There's no way they're going to get out of this alive. While Galen and Ramiro fight the plainsmen down there. They're defeated and confronted by Firebrand, who demands the opals. Galen demands Brithelm, and when he sees him, Firebrand reveals that he never planned on releasing any of them. He takes the opals and turns to leave as Shardos returns. Shardos tells everyone that he's a juggler and begins performing for the Quaitana, confusing and mesmerizing them because apparently they've never seen performers before. Then creates a distraction and they all attack the plainsmen. Galen and Brithelm run after Firebrand, who is intent on becoming a god with the new opals, but they quickly get lost in the tunnels. Back at Castle de Kayla, they delve deep into the caverns beneath the castle further, seeking a device that will stop the great Dale Worm named Tellus from awakening and destroying all of Ancelon. See, this great worm was implanted by Sargonis as a way for the gods of evil to escape the abyss and re-enter Kryn. Huh. Another earthquake drops much of the party that's down beneath the castle and buries other parts of the party. They all fall deep into water and resurface to see the machine, but remain unable to get to it. This is when we read a little bit about Sargonus's plot and his elation that they won't stop it in time. As Galen and Brithelm search for Firebrand, they discover his room only for Firebrand to then run off and summon a troll. They evade the troll, find him again, only for Firebrand to summon a ghost of the baker that Galen was fucking, sorry, having sex with, and then his dead brother, Alfric. Now, Alfric's ghost runs the baker ghost off, and Galen then attacks Alfric, who then is absorbed into the rock, and yet is at the same time pleased with Galen for having defeated him. Remember how I said I was digging this? That bloom has lost... I'm sorry. <laughs> the bloom is off the rose. This is the most nonsensical part of the entire novel. And that's saying something. I feel like there should be some Benny Hill music playing as they run around the caverns trying to catch each other. There's only a couple chapters left, and there is a ton to clear up. Primarily, what's the story here? Why would Sargonis tell the plainsman that he can be a god if his plan is to just destroy Ancelon and enter Kryn? Why does Firebrand believe he would be a god when nothing is um, corroborating with that idea when he finally gets the opal? Even his plainsman followers forget that he's the namer and end up following Shardos, the blind dude. And oh yeah, who the hell is Shardos anyway? Why can Brithelm use magic when it's convenient and not all the time? How can Galen pick up a ghost's sword when the ghost itself was absorbed into the rock? It doesn't make any sense. 
This contrivance is personified early in the story. It spends a couple pages talking about a horse that was never tamed. Well, the horse got away in the last earthquake and conveniently found its way to Danelle, who was just hopping on it and riding back to the castle. The horse that no one could tame or ride, she just happens upon and rides it back to the castle that it just ran away from. This type of nonsense is what turns me off of a novel. And I don't mind convenience, but the whole point of the animal was that it couldn't be tamed. Then the first gal who came along could ride it bareback with no problems? The group under the castle see what appears to be a target of some sort, assuming that it is a mechanism, and take shots at it with a bow until Bayard realizes that it's what the scorpion wanted all along. That's why he mentions the creature. It wasn't a mechanism, but rather the creature's eye. If they successfully hit it, it would then awaken completely and tear up Anselon. So what did they do? They decided not to attack it, of course, because they don't want to destroy Anselon. If they see... <laughs> okay, so Danell gets back to the castle to see the moat filled with water, and the horse takes it upon himself to jump the moat with ease. Isn't this the point of a moat? So you can't just jump across it without, co without a drawbridge or, or drowning? So she's taken to the ruined basement where they begin to excavate it from the earthquake and five Galandros, who was thought dead, and ultimately the rest of the buried party. There's a quick note about Sargonis who now defeated because they didn't shoot the damn monster. Harumphs that now Firebrand is useless. Let that sink in for a second, because it doesn't make any sense, no matter how long you marinate on it. So what was Sargonis' ultimate plan? Why include the plainsmen at all? So Galen is still chasing Firebrand, who is hurling illusion after illusion at him. Then a massive earthquake happens, and Firebrand says they need a fight, as magic isn't enough to defeat Galen. What?! None of this makes any sense at all! And frankly, I'm just getting mad reading the nonsense. So they square off Salamnic Knight against Plainsman Priest. I wonder who's going to win. Galen beheads him with one stroke of this illusionary sword. Then, Brithelm appears and tells Galen the troll must have been an illusion too because it's not following him anymore. Then a massive earthquake wrecks the land, knocks them down. Then the plainsmen all come up from the earth, led by Ramiro and Shardos. Remember, they forgot about their leader for no reason, and they just decided to elect Shardos as their new leader for no reason. <sighs> Ramiro leads Galen and Brithelm home, and the plainsmen reunite with the other half of their tribe, making Shardos their new namer. How could Shardos use magic ever? How could he know the information that he knows ever? I don't know. Why would he be the new namer and not Longwalker, the leader of the tribesmen up top? I don't know. It's never answered. It's not even addressed. They return to the castle to share stories, and arguably the best part of the novel is when Galen tells his father about Alfric's death. All right, so I'm a sucker for loss and sacrifice, and it always hits me in the feels whenever I read it or see it. So as they were singing the Salamnic prayer, I shed a tear because it was a tender moment. Galen ends up hooking up with Danell, and they're now expecting a child, and Bayard and Edith are expecting a child as well. Thus ends the novel, as abruptly as it started. And I'm left wondering, Why? Why did the Plainsmen take Brithelm in order to get the Opal when the Opal didn't give Firebrand any new powers? Why would Firebrand use, uh, only be useful to Sargonis if Tellus woke up? Why would he ever need Firebrand at all if the whole scheme hinged on the Scorpion tempting a Salamnic Knight to do what they, uh, they would normally do and shoot an arrow into a creature's eye using reverse psychology? And finally, why hinge it all on the behavior of an unknown individual 400 years later? Sounds like the stupidest divine plan ever to me. So let's make a novel out of it. I will not recommend this novel to anyone. While there were fleeting moments that were enjoyable, it was too random and disjointed to be a worthwhile read. So, 
this pissed me off. This novel sucks so bad. If it just had some logical sense to it, just a little, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's great. No, that makes total sense. Or at least it was enjoyable. But no, there's literally no logic. It's almost as if Michael Williams was writing a chapter and then like, mm, how can I make this more epic? Then wrote another chapter and then like, ooh, I got to tie in Plainsman. Ooh, let's write another chapter and ooh, how am I going to do this? Oh, I don't know. Everything that wrapped up the story happened in the last three chapters. Everything preceding that was just a long, drawn out getting to the damn caves. It's so painful. It sucks so bad. It makes me so mad because the first book was funny and it was adventurous and it was entertaining. This sweet hell. All right. So Chris says he read it over 20 years ago. You recall the feeling that Michael Williams successfully pulled the character arc and growth of Galen where the development felt earned at the end of the second book. I disagree. <laughs> Um, so you saw on Facebook that Weiss reached out to Joe Maganello and, uh, about the pilot. Joe told her that he never, it was never filmed, that Watsi rejected the pilot script saying it was good. I watched a video of Joe Maganello saying that it was filmed. So either he misspoke, which is entirely possible when you're answering a question on the spot that's being translated through Italian. Maybe he misspoke. Maybe it was just a mistake, but... I reported what I literally heard. So he probably meant script, if that's what he told Margaret. But he said filmed. Or he said pilot. All right, so um, let's see. You remember being surprised that you liked it at the end? The character did grow well, and you got more info into the inside of the knights. Totally disagree, Jeff. <laughs> totally disagree. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. Uh, Dino, how you doing? All right, this book was all right, but not memorable. Yeah, I'm going to forget it by the time I end this live stream. Dragonlance would be a fantastic film. You wrote a killer trailer several years ago. Uh, you have to see if it can track it down. Yeah, I'd love to hear or see that. The Dragonlance film that was made is better than Dishonor Among Thieves. I'm not familiar with Dishonor Among Thieves. Oh, you mean Honor Among Thieves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I enjoy the, the animated film for what it is. It has tons of mistakes and errors and stuff like that, but whatever. I still enjoy it. Uh, let's see. Don, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Why would TSR ever let something like that go through? Because people bought it. People. This was at a time when people were just frenzied with fiction, drag, Dungeons and Dragons fictional novels. This was, you know, a few years after they started doing it and people were just going crazy over them. And so they just let people who at the time weren't even authors write books and put them out. The first book, Weasel's Luck, did really well because it was really good. And so the follow-up, this, that's why it got greenlit, you know? But yeah, if they read this and then said, yeah, go ahead and publish it, it was a, a cash grab only. Because it, it may, and maybe, maybe other people understand it more than I did, but it made no sense to me. Like the actual story, the plot made zero sense. I just don't understand it at all. Michael Williams is better poetry than novel writing. Yeah. Yeah. Don, uh, you missed a chance to work, write for TSR and Dragonlance. Well, you can always do fanfic. Always write your own world. You know, it's always possible. All right. So that is it for my review of Galen Benighted by Michael Williams. What do you think of Sir Goddess's plan? Were the Plainsmen added just to pay off the white savior trope, which I didn't even talk about. You know what? Maybe I'll talk about that now really quick. Um, <laughs> the way that Europeans see indigenous Americans, Native Americans, um, is as a singular collective called Indian, right? It's one culture to them, and that's it. The way Native Americans saw themselves as individual tribes. So you can compare it to Germans, French, Austrians, uh, Englands, uh, Englands, <laughs> English, um, all the different countries all see themselves of, as different cultural versions of white people. Every Native American tribe saw themselves the same way as completely different cultural tribes of Native Americans. 
They were not one thing. They were all wildly different. Some of them raped and murdered on a regular basis, enslaved um, on a regular basis. Some of them were a little more peaceful. Some of them worked with massive trading encampments and had massive buildings. I mean, it was a whole range of different types of individuals that made up Native Americans. All this is to say that when it comes to Dragonlance and the portrayal of the Kweishu, Kweitana, Kweinara, uh, Kwekiri tribes, they're all one entity. They are just plains people, right? There, there's no differentiating between them. If you lived in Calaman or you lived in Palanthus, you would see yourselves as different types of people. But in your Kweinara or Kwekiri or, or uh, Kweishu tribes, you're all the same. You're all plain people. So there's a shortcut to thinking when it comes to writing uh, indigenous peoples or native peoples or primitive peoples in Dragonlance. It's always been there. I don't mind it because I understand that the authors may not understand Native American history or the actual history of America. And so maybe they just don't know. Maybe they're ignorant about it. And so they're like, it's a fantasy world. We're just going to tie them into Indians and that'll be that. Okay, you don't do any whatever. Except that there is this horrible, horrible trope of Americans, Europeans, coming to America, taking the land, taking babies away from families, Native American babies, putting them in boarding schools, beating them, sexually and physically abusing them, and sometimes murdering them, actually castrating the women without their consent, refusing to allow them to speak their own native languages, cutting their hair against their will, and this is all to children, all so that they can save them from themselves. They can educate them so that they are not primitive peoples, but educated peoples. And so what does this story have to do with that, except for the fact that it's Salamnic Knights going to save Plainsmen people from themselves and they do just that. <laughs> That's what happens. The Slamnic Knights go to go get Brithelm, another Slamnic Knight held captive by half of one of the Quainara tribe, which is now the Quaitana. And the Quainara tribe is broken half. And so the surface level of the tribe is saying, we need help. I need you to go save us, Slamnic Knights. And the Slamnic Knights are like, we will save you, native peoples. And they go into the caverns and they save them, bringing back the tribesmen and reuniting the tribe. So it's an old trope that is shrouded in torture and pain and sorrow and the destruction of native peoples and their cultures. And yet we're just using it as fun for a novel. I'm reading too much into it, clearly, but that's the reality of the situation when you can't help but compare and contrast fantasy novels with their influences in real life you have to then carry everything along with that. So that's part of what I really hated about this novel, is it did the white savior trope that has never been a real thing, and it's only been the exact opposite. There's a reason why we're called the white devil. We earned it! 100%. It's so stupid. All right, so let's get back to closing this thing out. Um, and finally, did this make any sense to anyone who read it? Because it didn't make any sense to me. You can email me at info at dlsaga.com or leave a comment below. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell to get notified about upcoming videos, and click the like button. This all goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. And this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance saga, even when some of the novels are not so wonderful. So, for Dragonlance Saga, my name's Adam. Until next time, Slanjavar.